Thank you so much. Uh, John, you never met Herb, but he'd be very, very proud tonight. Because like you, he viewed what he did not as an occupation, but as a vocation and a passion. And I had a chance to see some of your work again upstairs. And it reminded me so much of Herb Block. I had an opportunity to talk to him so many times. And Robin always found a way to put me at his table at social events so we could talk politics. And he told me one thing I always remember. He said, you know, you do what I try to do. I said, what's that, Herbie? He goes, yeah, pop him right in the nose. <laughs> and it's a very good rule and lesson to have in life. I said, I don't mean to hurt anybody. Herb came on Meet the Press for his first and only appearance in 1996. And we talked at great length before he came on about his work. And he said to me, of all your guests, who was your favorite? I said, I don't have a favorite Herb. I said, but probably the most memorable was Ross Perot. He said, he's a cartoonist dream. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I remember that interview. It was in May of 1992. Ross Perot was ahead of George Herbert Walker Bush and Bill Clinton in the polls as an independent candidate. And he, Perot came on Meet the Press. I said, Mr. Perot, welcome. You're now a candidate for president. You've identified the deficit as the most important problem confronting our nation. What's your solution? He said, what? <laughs> I said, well, this is the way it works. <laughs> you identify the problem. Then you announce for president. Then you offer a solution. What is your solution? He said, now then, if I knew you were going to ask me all these trick questions, I wouldn't come on your program. <laughs> so we went back and forth, back and forth, and it got rather feisty. And I had to catch a shuttle flight from Washington to New York, and the flight attendant ran down the aisle. She said, that Ross Perot, what do you think of him? I said, ma'am, I don't really comment on that. I leave it to the cartoonist and to the <laughs> radio talk show host and now the bloggers. I try to ask questions, elicit views, and let you make a judgment. But I am endlessly curious, as a viewer, as a voter, as a flight attendant, what do you think of Ross Perot? <laughs> she paused, looked down, looked up, and said, he strikes me as the kind of guy that would never return his tray table to the upright position. <laughs> <laughs> Cha-ching! <laughs> I told Herb so often he would want to know about these personalities, these politicians, not only what they were like on the set, but some perspective I could bring off the air. But he was endlessly curious about so many different people, even non-politicians. I one time did a special uh, Meet the Press from the All-Star Game on baseball in the state of the sport, and I had Yogi Berra on. And Herb was so intrigued by Yogi Berra, another cartoonist dream. <laughs> and I, I said to him, I said, Herb, you will not believe this. I asked Yogi, did he really say all the things they say he said? Uh, you know, when you come to the fork, take it, and so forth. And I said, Herb, it was worse than you think. <laughs> Yogi's son told me that the family went to a local pizzeria in St. Louis, his hometown. And the waiter came over and said, Yogi, what would you like? And Yogi said, I want a pepperoni mushroom pizza. And the waiter said, you want that cut in six or eight slices? And Yogi said, six, I can't eat eight. <laughs> I'll tell you, Herb loved that, I'll tell you. Herb. So Whitey Ford, the great Yankee pitcher, was on the program. And we're going around and around about baseball. And I said, Whitey, <laughs> is this real? <laughs> what is your favorite Yogi Berra story? He said, well, we were playing the Chicago White Sox, and Ford said he had been out the night before with Mickey Mantle, and probably in no condition to pitch. He said the first pitch, many, uh, first pitch, Louis Aparicio, a single to right field. Second pitch, Nellie Fox, single to left field. Third pitch, Ford hit Minnie Minoso. Three pitches, bases loaded. Fourth pitch, Ted Klazuski. Gone, grand slam home run. Four pitches, four nothing White Sox. 
Casey Stengel, the Yankee manager, came out from the, the dugout. Yogi came from behind the plate, took his mask off, and Casey said, hey, Yogi, says, does Whitey have his stuff tonight? And Yogi said, how the hell did I? Oh, I haven't caught a ball yet. <laughs> So this was Herb's favorite. I then said to Yogi, tell me about how much baseball has changed. He said, oh, it's extraordinary. I played for the same team my whole life, pinstripes. We played cards. We checked box scores. We used to go to the hotel. We had roommates. We used to stay up all night and talk baseball. I said, well, Yogi, out of curiosity, who is your favorite roommate? He said, oh, I'm not saying it just because he's here in this interview, but my guy, Whitey Ford. I said, oh, that's pretty nice. That's pretty sweet. I said, uh, Whitey, you feel the same way about Yogi? He said, no. I said, well, out of curiosity, why do you, who is your favorite roommate? He said, Angie Dickinson. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Whitey. Time to go now. <laughs> Cartoons have played such an important role in my life. And the more I thought about tonight, the more I realized that. When I was a, a very little boy growing up in Buffalo, New York, uh, my dad um, used to drive a truck for the Buffalo News, uh, delivering the newspapers throughout all of Western New York. And so they were something to be treasured and read at our house, a very uh, Irish Catholic neighborhood where not everyone received the paper on a daily basis, usually waited for Sunday. But ours came home every day with dad. And I remember we were asked at school, asked, I guess is a polite word, we were told at school to memorize the Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address. And I remember so vividly, and I called up a Meet the Press researcher today and I said, Chris, I remember this like yesterday. Bruce Shanks, a political cartoonist for the Buffalo News, did a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln. And in it, he put the words of the Gettysburg Address. And I remember it because the word larger was, was over, the word, over the right ear of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and sure enough, there it is. <laughs> Which is absolutely important in my life because it, it demonstrated to me how a person like Abraham Lincoln could offer such powerful words and it could be captured in this way. And here I am remembering it some 45 years later. And it has always been the case for me to understand what Herb Block did and what John does. It is that they're able to take an important issue, a controversial issue, a pressing issue, and offer it to readers and to viewers in a way that is meaningful and understandable. It's the same lesson that I try to do on a Sunday morning, not with commentary, but with eliciting information. And what Herb Block told me on 1996, and John confirmed tonight, Herb said, every cartoon I do is a sign commentary. It's what I believe. It's, it, it is my point of view, and I'm proud to express it, and I'm free to express it. Those are the same lessons that those of us who practice journalism on a daily basis or interview our political leaders must understand. We too must elicit from our guests, from our politicians, who they are and where they stand on the issues. Not after they become president, but before they become president. I do not believe that you can make tough decisions unless you can answer tough questions. I cannot tell you how many times a political cartoon, an editorial cartoon, has focused my thinking, helped my understanding, crystallized my questioning, demonstrated my, the way I felt about what was happening in our country, or gave me insight into a political figure. I was blessed with an education that encouraged that kind of creative thinking. It was Sister Mary Lucille in seventh grade who summoned me to the front of the room with one of these. 
Timothy, we need to find an alternative vehicle to channel your excessive energy. <laughs> but she started a school newspaper and made me the editor. And I was the editor, the publisher, the mimeographer, the collator, <laughs> the stapler, the reporter. But I fell in love with journalism, with the written word. And when John Kennedy was assassinated, we wrote a special edition of our newspaper and sent it to President Johnson and the former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy and the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, this little tiny school in South Buffalo, New York. And we received letters from each of those three, which I still have to this day. It was the first time I understood the nexus of writing something that people read, understood, and responded to. And I recalled at that particular moment also a political cartoon. And you all remember it as well, when Bill Malden of the Chicago Sun-Times had Abraham Lincoln, his face in his hands. I was a young boy of all 13, filled with emotion and unsure of the way I felt with the death of President Kennedy. I remember my dad hammering the sign on our, on our house, 174 Woodside Avenue, Kennedy for president. I said, Dad, are we for Kennedy? He said, yep. I said, why? He said, he's one of us. <laughs> Irish Catholic. I kid him now. I said, Big Russ, you didn't tell me he was rich. <laughs> <laughs> But that alone helps me understand this debate, this discussion we're now having in this campaign about gender politics, race politics, identity politics. I understand it. I saw it firsthand. I, I know how Irish Catholics felt that one of theirs had an opportunity to become president of the United States despite their ethnicity, despite their religious views. I had Father John Sturm, a Jesuit priest, the prefect of discipline, who would find me in the back writing essays or articles for my school newspaper rather than listening to his simulating lectures. And he threw me against the lockers and I said, Father, please, I'm, I'm new here. I'm still trying to work out the rhythms of the school. And <laughs> Lord, I said, don't you have any mercy? He said, Russert, mercy's for God, I deliver justice. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a cartoon. 